Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to the USC Institute on Inequalities and Global global virtual lecture series. My name is Sophia Greskin, and it's my great pleasure to welcome you to Justice, Critical Science, and the Two-Edged Sword of Data, Structural Problems Require Structural Solutions. Great title, Nancy, I got to say. Anyway, honestly, in this moment, a super timely talk uh, within USC as a whole, within the Keck School of Medicine, within our department, let alone the rest of the world, we're all working to better address racism, including structural racism and health inequities, including in relationship to sex and gender and the intersection of racial and gender discrimination. Well, in fact, all forms of discrimination on health and well being with more focus and more intention than we ever have. So I have to say, this talk could not be more timely. Um, let me just give a few words about Nancy. I assume you all know who she is and what she does, or you wouldn't be here. And I, I strongly encourage you to look at her bio on the website. Uh, speaking of justice, I'm certainly not going to do her justice through this intro. Uh, so Nancy Krieger is professor of social epidemiology from the Department of Social and Behavioral Sciences at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health and director of the HSPH Interdisciplinary Concentration on Women, Gender, and Health a concentration, which I guess I have to say we started together and co-directed until I moved to USC. Uh, so please read her full bio, but in short, she is an internationally recognized social epidemiologist with a background in biochemistry, philosophy of science, and history of public health, with more than 30 years of activism that involves social justice, science, and health. And uh, in 1994, she co-founded, and she still chairs the Spirit of 1848 Caucus of the American Public Health Association, which I assume everyone on the Zoom already subscribes to. And if you don't, you really should. Um, but I, I really see it as the premier spot in the United States concerned with the links between social justice and public health. And you know, Nancy's work always brings together the conceptual and the empirical in ways that help us all to think not only about what's happening out there, but right here within our own disciplinary and institutional silos and to bring really a critical eye on all that we do, no matter how well-intentioned we might be. So justice really is at the heart of her work. Um, and that I think gives her an incredible lens on the question of data. It's good, but also, also it's bad. Um, so this event is done in honor of International Women's Day, and I think it builds on a longstanding partnership and, and friendship often focused around International Women's Day activities, so it seemed only fitting, Nancy, to bring you here, here for this. Um, and everybody, I do want to say, this has really been an incredibly busy day for her, so I just want to just like, acknowledge that and just that it's been a long day. She spoke on Democracy Now! this morning on the Radical Socialist History of International Women's Day. She did a talk and ran an event at the School of Public Health. Health. Now she's with us here. Um, and, you know, we're incredibly lucky to have her with us. And as I read in a review of hers recently, Nancy really is one of the important intellectual leaders of our world, of our movement right now. And I couldn't agree more. So just to say before Nancy turning it over to you, please as an audience, if you can drop any questions in the Q&A function, we'll come to your questions at the end. Nancy's going to speak for about 40, 45 minutes, and that should give us a good amount of time uh, to chit chat. So Nancy, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. I really appreciate that intro. I'm really delighted to be with all of you. And let me do the proverbial share screen and assume that Zoom doesn't do anything weird. All right. So I am really, truly glad to be with you today on March 8th, which is, of course, International Women's Day. And in the spirit of social justice is at the heart of this day and also solidarity. In my talk, I'm going to reflect on health justice, critical science, and the two-edged sword of data. Structural problems require structural solutions. Before I begin, let me start as I do for all my talks by acknowledging that as a US person in Boston, Massachusetts, I'm on indigenous lands and pay heed to critical indigenous thinking. And also I speak at a time when longstanding issues of structural racism combined with mounting wealth inequities, climate crises, assaults and democratic rules and scientific evidence, not to mention also LGBT rights, et cetera, have come to the fore, all profoundly intertwined with issues of health justice, and of course, that includes reproductive justice. So topics that I'm going to address include critical thinking and theory for better science and action, buttressed by several empirical examples, including COVID and contemporary continued health harms of past injustice, as exemplified by Jim Crow and historical redlining. My premise is that another world is possible in which health justice exists, and aspects of knowing whether or not we are there re does require data. 
But what are data? According to the Oxford English Dictionary, data is the plural of datum, itself the past participle of the Latin verb dare, to give, and thus in effect means, quote unquote, that which is given. As both account and mass noun, it effectively refers to information typically used for scientific investigation. Who could argue with that? Well, Nothing in science or anything else is ever so simple. Instead, invoking the notion of data requires reckoning with what data are and who wields the two-edged sort of data. A first crucial point is that data, contrary to its etymology, is never a given. Hence, despite being the past participle of the Latin verb dare, to give, data are always produced by people, revealing what they observe, record, measure, or mismeasure, fail to see or suppress. A key sticking point to remember is that privilege is always defined in part by what you can afford to ignore. One accordingly must always ask who produces and controls the data, to what end, engaging with what history. The case of racialized data in the US and health population statistics is highly relevant case in point, whose histories of contested production and use extend back to this country's origins as a slave republic and settler colonial nation. Mindful of time limits, I'll simply flag that US data on racialized groups are first produced and used in the 18th century CE by the enfranchised minority of white men with property to entrench injustice, to characterize who was enslaved versus free, which indigenous tribes and nations were versus were not under colonial and then federal and state jurisdiction. In the 19th century CE, as abolitionists, including the first generation of credentialed African American physicians, began to contest and contextualize racialized data to challenge both slavery and its supporters, including proponents of scientific racism. 20th century contestations swirled around use of racialized data to both oppose and also support both Jim Crow and eugenics, two ideologies of innate inferiority versus superiority upheld by the state, reflecting the beliefs and interests of property, political and academic, including scientific elite. Then in the wake of major legislation finally won in 1965 that afforded new protection of civil rights and expanded immigration, uses of official government data on racialized groups began to shift from justifying injustice to providing evidence of injustice. However, the successful civil rights strategy of using racialized data to demonstrate discrimination sparked, not surprisingly, a conservative backlash, leading to two types of resistance. One was to try to suppress collection or reporting of racialized data. The other, in legal cases, was to require evidence of motivation, not just disparate impact. Hence, the two-edged sword of data. In societies with deep histories of structural racism, not to have any data on racialized groups usually couched as a quote unquote colorblind approach leads to the problem of quote unquote no data, no problem, and the denial of and inability to approve that a problem exists, hence edge one of the sword. Edge two is that problematic data, whether wrongly conceived, wrongly used, or both, can also be a big problem. These edges cut deeply in relation to any and all forms of injustice. And meanwhile, keep in point the actual point, which is what are the data needed to secure health justice? This way of thinking about science and data is grounded in the ways of theorizing afforded by the ecosocial theory of disease distribution, which I first proposed in 1994, and whose features I've most recently elaborated in my new book, Ecosocial Theory and Body Truths and the People's Health. This theory is centrally focused on how we as social beings and biological organisms, like any living creatures, daily integrate and embody biologically our societal and ecological context, thereby producing population patterns of health and health inequities core to consider our levels, pathways, and power, time in relation to both life course and historical context and generation, and how inequitable social relations, in particular involving racism, class, gender, and sexuality, are connected and jointly embodied, thereby shaping population distributions of health via pathways involving both political economy and political ecology. Also note that ecosocial theory's fourth core construct, agency and accountability, refers both to who and what at each and every level is responsible for health inequities and for the research to explain population health. At issue in part is who benefits from injustice and from research which ignores injustice versus who is harmed by injustice and by the overt suppression, lack of funding, and also self-censorship that can limit research on these issues. <clears throat> 
Beyond this, as far as population health is concerned, not to mention everyday life, embodiment means that we are not a member of a particular racialized group one day, have a particular gender identity or sexual orientation on another, and on still another day have a particular social class or wealth or income or educational level. We are all of these, always, at once, and the same holds for our nationality, immigration status, primary language and literacy, disability status, and the places where we live and work. This embodied stance, which rejects determinism and embraces historical contingency, challenges the dominant view expressed by the figure to the left, the quincux, which was designed in 1889 by Sir Francis Galton, who famously coined the term eugenics and who also invented the correlation coefficient in his quest to prove that population distributions, including of intelligence, were quote unquote a product of heredity, not quote unquote environment. Seeking to explain population distributions, Galton divides his quincux so that identical pellets poured through a funnel that randomly bounced off carefully placed pins would fall into different bins and produce a normal distribution with the height of the column reflecting the probability of different pathways of descent. To Galton, the device beautifully demonstrated the properties of what he called the law of frequency of error, a law that he claimed, quote, would have been personified by the Greeks and deified if they had known of it. Each element, as it were, sorted into place finds a preordained niche accurately adapted to fit it, end quote. Now consider the alternative mechanical device to the right. It was built by several late 20th century physicists who altered the shape of the funnel and the pins in order to generate a log normal curve. That is, the logarithm of the values has a normal distribution. Illustrating the interplay of structure and chance, it thus offers an illuminating mechanical metaphor for showing how altered structure can change population distributions, including of identical individuals, and do so by affecting the underlying probabilities of events randomly occurring to that population's individuals. This means that embodied differences between populations are simply that, observed embodied differences in a given context, not clear-cut indicators of quote-unquote innate difference. Structured clance allows us to see this possibility more clearly, and the structuring plays out over time and different spatial scales as well. Two implications of the eco-social construct of embodiment are the need to reject biological essentialism and to embrace instead embodied integration. In this increasingly omic, nanoscale, centric, and hyperbiomedical research moment, it's critical to emphasize that the drivers of current and changing societal patterns of disease distribution, including health inequities, are exogenous to people's bodies and instead reside in the body politic. Nor can explanations of disease distribution be reduced solely to disease mechanisms, since the latter do not account for why rates and population patterns of disease change in complex ways over time and place. It is also essential to distinguish between what I refer to as biological expressions of injustice versus unjust interpretations of biology. The first of these refers to the adverse embodied consequences of exposure to class injustice, racism, sexism, heterosexism, gender binarism, etc., and in effect constitute the embodied phenotypes via which injustice is biologically expressed. The second of these refers to how injustice can distort understandings of biology. For example, when observed social group differences in health are presumed to arise a priori from innate biology. Imagine starting instead with a premise of shared humanity and dignity, recognizing that in racialized unjust societies, good luck finding health outcomes that don't manifest as racialized health inequities. Additional implications of the theory for metrics are relative, rel readily illustrated in relation to area-based social metrics or ABSMs, which are widely used in public health monitoring, analysis, and interventions. Such work necessarily engages with issues of power, place, levels, and history. Define an area, and by definition, the question of boundaries come up, set by whom and why. Are the areas intended for administrative purposes or political representation? Are the boundaries affected by biophysical features, whether made by this planet or altered by people? And are these areas nested in or cut across other relevant boundaries? As for the social metrics, how does agency play out? What power relations do they capture? Who is versus isn't visible? Are these metrics based solely on population composition, 
or do they reflect relationships between societal groups? Do they capture the rules of the game, past or present, that set the terms of societal group relations and health inequities, with the latter referring to unfair, avoidable, and in principle preventable differences in health metrics between societal groups? A key purpose of ABSMs or any metrics for health equity then is to make visible who needs to do what with whom to advance health justice and to identify who benefits from injustice. I note this approach runs counter to the dominant upstream downstream metaphor, which fails to recognize complex multi-directional power relationships within and across levels and societal groups. Consider the usual trope of federal to state to local to individual. However, as I noted back in 2008, it was U U.S. Supreme Court recognition of the individual right of privacy in Roe v. Wade that redounded back up to the state level and ensured abortion rights, and we see this now terribly playing out in reverse. Broadening out these ideas, this slide shows a schema I developed to distinguish not only between levels of metrics for injustice, that is structural, individual, and internalized, but also whether the metrics do versus do not explicitly identify agency and accountability, that is, who is driving or gaining from the injustice as opposed to merely describing it. Overt and non-explicit rules of the game matter, as do indicators of injustice, and it's always, always essential to also to be mindful at the individual level of what individuals may or may not be willing or able to self-report. The net implication is that an anti-essentialist and by definition anti-racist science is essential. The point of analyzing scientifically how racism or any other form of injustice harms health is not to prove injustice is wrong because by definition it is wrong, nor is the point to do politically correct science so-called. Rather, the point is to do correct science, to generate publicly testable and tested knowledge that provides insights into who is bearing the burden of exposure, disease, and death, and to ascertain if these distributions are inequitable. And it is crucial to do this work in mind, keeping in mind the history, two different kinds of history, the societal history of the problems in the data, the individual or life course history in relation to exposure, age and onset of disease, et cetera, the pathological or cellular history and ideologic period, that is, how long does it take for a disease to develop given exposure, and also evolutionary history to gain insight into the biologies of embodiment. We and all life on this planet live as emergent embodied phenotypes, and understanding how we embody history is key to changing history for health justice. Mind you, these kinds of critical approaches to science and public health, our data, are nothing new, and instead are deeply embedded in the history of our field. On this slide, I showed to the left Dr. James McCune Smith the first credentialed African-American physician in the US who obtained his medical degree in Scotland in 1837 because no US medical school at the time would admit black students. In his own words, quote, the son of a self-emancipated bondwoman, end quote, McCune Smith was born, raised and lived most of his life as a physician in New York City where he provided health care to the city's black and indigent population and was prominent in both abolitionist and suffragist movements. In 1859, a year that witnessed not only the raid on Harper's Ferry by John Brown and his followers to oppose slavery, but also publication of Charles Darwin's Origin of the Species, McCune Smith wrote a very famous rebuttal to Thomas Jefferson's 14th query, in which Jefferson asked whether innate differences precluded blacks and whites, so-called, from ever living together as equals. Reversing Jefferson's cause and effect, McCune Smith rejected the then and still dominant idea of quote unquote race as innate biology, positing instead that white supremacy and racism caused the observed black white differences in physique and health status. And he used the example of Ricketts to counter the denominant view that it was uniquely affliction of black population by pointing to its equally high prevalence among the white poor in Ireland. Comparisons and context matter. Similarly, in Europe, the social democratic German physician and later politician Rudolf Virchow gave voice to similar views as expressed in his classic 1848 investigation of a typhus epidemic, which ravaged an impoverished and politically repressed region of Upper Silesia. The remedy he proposed, quote, full and unlimited democracy, end quote. One generation later, Dr. S. Josephine Baker, progressive physician, suffragist, feminist, and lesbian established in 1908, the world's first Bureau of Child Hygiene in the New York City Department of Health. Challenging eugenic dogma, 
Her data-driven community-based work dramatically reduced infant mortality and child illness among New York's poor immigrants. Putting into practice Health Commissioner Herman Biggs edict and then the, what was became the department's motto since 1911, which is that, quote, public health is purchasable with the natural limitations, a community can determine its own death rate, end quote. Baker actively deployed public health nurses and inspectors to evaluate children's health rather than send postcards to parents to fill out, which were rarely returned. And doing this increased the percent of children with disabilities increasing uh, increasing from 8% in 1908 to 85% in 1911. In other words, again, another world is possible by dint of vision, effort, and institutional support and using data adroitly, she made it so. Further highlighting the need for critical science is that in recent years, we've come to live in a time in which so-called alternative facts have a political balance that is used to trump, as it were, bona fide scientific evidence, whether about climate change, pregnancy, transgender health, and much else. Six years ago, scientists in Boston and globally led unprecedented demonstrations to quote unquote stand up for science, including one here in February 2017, which packed Copley Square. But is it enough to simply stand up for science given the history I've recounted? No. We must always ask, who's science? Eugenics, after all, claim to be a science, and scientists are also deeply involved in the sciences of fossil fuel extraction and use, weapons, and most recently, big data science to advance profoundly anti-public health and anti-democratic political agendas. This is our context. Which brings me to the context of this lecture. We live in a world that is simultaneously alive with sensuous life and beauty and also rampant ecological degradation and destruction. The past four de decades of neoliberal economics building on centuries of, of colonialism and imperialism have led to a world of growing social spatial polarization with ever greater concentrations of private wealth as epitomized by the factoids that in 2023, the richest 1% of the world's population owns an estimated 45.6% of the wealth. Maps scaled to the population metric employed show the US bloated with billionaires while the African continent, the world's largest, dwindles to the merest thread. The reverse holds for absolute poverty. In the US, where the top 1% own a greater share of wealth than their 1% counterparts in various European countries, three white men in 2019 owned as much wealth as the bottom 50% of the US population. Corporate taxes have plummeted as the corresponding income and wealth of the wealthiest is soared, and intergenerational economic mobility is on the skids. Long-standing and enormous wealth gaps by racialized groups are also on the rise, and in 2019, the U.S. white median household wealth was fully eight times that of Black Americans and 4.8 times those of Latinos. The gap for households with children was even more stark. And then COVID-19 hit, exacerbating all of these trends, with billionaires ballooning in wealth and number while everyone else lost. In January 2023, Oxfam reported that the wealth grabs by the global super rich have accelerated since the onset of the pandemic, with the richest 1% capturing almost two thirds of all new wealth since 2020, while global poverty has increased for the first time in 25 years. And tellingly, according to Miriam Webster, the top two words of the year for 2022 were gaslighting and oligarch. Together, capturing this age of ever-growing internet-fueled disinformation, pushing the rule of the ultra-rich. Keeping this context in mind, let me now turn to some critical empirical examples that reckon with the two-edged sword of data. So first, using the case of COVID-19, this slide shows the first edge of the sword, problems that arise when no data exist. Early on in the pandemic, during the first crucial months, U.S. national health data on COVID-19 inequities under the prior administration were missing in action. In response and in outrage, hard-hit racialized communities, their advocates and responsive politicians demanded that the data be provided and data journalists stepped up to address the gaps. Heeding the call, our team swiftly produced some of the first data in mid-April 2020 on COVID-19 death rates for all U.S. counties stratified by key social metrics. These place-based data readily revealed that the highest death rates for COVID-19 during the onset of the pandemic occurred in counties with the highest poverty rates, highest crowded housing, and highest proportion of populations of color. These are systemic problems structured by social injustice, and I emphasize the variables we use are not simply proxies or so-called ecologic variables that are allegedly a stand-in for quote-unquote individual characteristics. They are instead contextual measures telling you precisely about the context of communities hit hardest by COVID. <laughs> 
Building on this study, we then turned to inequities in the mortality surge tied to the pandemic and in early May 2020 reported among the first US data on the surge in relation to social metrics, again, using place-based data linked. And again, relying on utilizing working papers or equivalently preprints to get the findings out quickly while also submitting, of course, for peer review. For this study, we compared the total mortality rate, that is the number of deaths per 100,000 persons per two-week period, to the mortality rate for the same two-week period based on the average for the past five years from 2015 to 19. The value of this approach is that it captures all the excess deaths, both those categorized as COVID-19 and those that should have been attributed to COVID-19 were misclassified, for example, due to lack of COVID testing. And it also captures deaths due to the pandemic, but not the infection, for example, due to delays in getting needed non-COVID health care, while also accounting for background seasonal fluctuation and causes of death. Using this approach, we computed the excess deaths for every city, town, and zip code in Massachusetts, stratified by their social and economic composition. On this slide, I show our updated analyses from our article that was published in mid-October 2020 for two of our four variables. The index of concentration of the extremes, or ICE, for racialized economic segregation, a metric I'll say more about in a moment, whereby a value of negative one means that 100% of the households are low income and of color, and a value of one means that 100% of the households are high income, white, non-Hispanic. And then also show the data for percent of crowded households. The data for 2015 to 19 are adjacent to the 2020 data and the lines show the groups ranging from low to high for each variable. And no matter what the measure used, all social metrics show the same terrible social facts, albeit most acutely for the ICE for racialized economic segregation. The death rate surged much higher in communities that bear the brunt of racial, racialized and economic injustice. While these patterns may not be surprising, our study was among the first to document them and provided critical evidence necessary to inform COVID policies and priorities. Moreover, our study, which we conducted in collaboration with the Boston Globe, the local newspaper, enabled reporters to do important investigative reporting on some hard hit communities our research identified, but which had not yet had public coverage of their hardship. This reporting helped galvanize public health and public awareness in these communities, putting their experiences and needs in context while pointing to the role of unsafe workplaces and crowded households as tied to unaffordable housing and not population density as critical to community spread. As another illustration of edge one, that is no data, no problem, consider these results from a study we published in November 2020, the first study to analyze workplace OSHA complaint data in relation to US COVID-19 mortality rates. The context was a federal administration that refused to establish any COVID-19 workplace standards, reduced workplace inspections, and reported virtually no data on COVID by occupation. We revealed that rises in workers' COVID-19 complaints shown by the vertical bars with blue bars for workers in the healthcare and other social assistance occupations, purple for retail workers, orange for workers in manufacturing, and tan for the rest, resemble an epidemic curve with mortality rates shown by the black line following in kind. The bottom half shows a heat map we made of correlations between complaints and mortality rates and demonstrate that the strongest correlation occurred for death 16 days after complaints with an R equal to 0 0.83. The power of this finding is the temporal order. It was not as if workers became aware of rising death rates and started complaining at work. Instead, workers complained first and that then the deaths followed with an unsurprising lag at that time of a little over two weeks, given the incubation period and time to manifestation of lethal symptoms. Data on occupational inequities in COVID remain still scant at government websites, despite mounting evidence of essential workers increased risk of COVID-19 exposure, illness, and death. Ignoring or suppressing these data does not make these problems go away. It just makes it harder for those organizing for health justice to press their case for better prevention and protection, both in courts of law and also in the court of public opinion. However, since January 2021, under the new administration, new data began cropping up at government websites, albeit still grossly inadequate. Taking advantage of the first publicly released data on US COVID-19 mortality rates by both racialized group and educational level, which is posted on February 2nd, 2021, we demonstrated, which meant that the data were there, they just hadn't been posted. We demonstrated the problem with reporting solely racialized rates devoid of attention to the structural links between racialized and economic injustice. 
The top row shows the COVID-19 mortality rates per 100,000 persons per years for January 1, 2020 through January 31, 2021, and shows stark evidence of both racialized and educational inequities with the gradients for the latter especially steep. And then we combine these data to reveal the educational gradients within racialized groups. Moreover, in analyses in which we set the most privileged group as the referent, that is white non-Hispanic persons with a postgraduate degree who had a rate of 80, we found that mortality rate ratios were over three times higher for black, indigenous, and white non-Hispanic persons with at most high school degree who had rates on the order of 350 to 425 per 100,000. And they were eight times higher for indigenous persons with less than high school with their rates reading, reaching 625 per 100,000. Note, however, that education has been a standard variable on the death certificate since 1989. It is not as if these are obscure data. Occupational data are also standard on the death certificate and can and should be analyzed for working age adults. Once again, the two-edged sword of data cuts deep. The absence of linked racialized and economic data is a denial of health justice. Nor can one employ U.S. Census racialized categories uncritically without regard to historical context. As this graphic revealing the historical dynamics of racialized categories employed in the U.S. Census shows, it should be clear these are social, not essentialist categories, and grappling with their meaning and implications for health status requires a clear understanding of and data regarding their societal context. At first, the categories employed chiefly distinguished between free white versus enslaved versus quote unquote other non-voting populations. And then the number of groups later expanded driven by histories of territorial expansion and immigration, both restriction and expansion on up through the requirements specified by the 1997 Directive 15 from the US Federal Office of Management and Budget. However, be aware that what data are crammed into these bins depends in part on what questions are asked, and it's always important to read the fine print. For example, while the 2010 and 2020 U.S. Census end up with the same quote-unquote final categories, the 2020 Census use much more refined questions, leading to different and perhaps more accurate population estimates. A heads up, too, that in June 2022, the chief statistician of the U.S. announced their office is beginning a formal review to revise OMB's Statistical Policy Directive Number 15, with the goal of completing this revision by no later than the summer of 2024. And this, of course, has major implications for U.S. Census data, health data, including birth and death certificates, and means that there's going to be a need to create bridging methods to enable tracking temporal, temporal trends as was done when the prior 1977 standards were updated in 1997. And just next week, the OMB is having its first public hearings, which you can join by web. You can go to their website and register. And they're doing three sets of public hearings to have input into what these standards are. Another change of note is that in 2021, for the first time ever, the U.S. Census asked questions about sexual orientation and gender identity via a new experimental data product, the U.S. Household Pulse Survey, which was designed to obtain and report real-time data on the impact of COVID-19 pandemic. Such representative census data at the national and state level had never existed before, thus addressing edge one of the sword, no data, no problem, and also serve as a corrective to prior US census practices, which in the past had included treating quote unquote same sex households as a data quote unquote error to be corrected. That's the second edge of the sword. Problematic data, big problem. The US Census Household Pulse Survey has also generated unprecedented real time data critical to understanding the pandemic and its impacts in real time. The lack of such real time data is an edge two problem. Thus, in the US, the extent to which any large scale COVID-19 analyses have used any community data, including our own, they've largely relied on the most recent American community survey data at first for 2014 to 18 or since December 20 for 2015 to 2019. And a heads up that while the 2016 to 2020 five-year ACS data are now released, the U.S. Census deems the one-year 2020 ACS data to be quote-unquote experimental as in worry about it due to the impact of the COVID-19. So data users beware. But of course, any such static five-year data by definition misses the shocks of the pandemic. Consider the first graph we produced in December 2020, showing time trends in co county rates of COVID deaths in relation to different social metrics, including the COVID-19 Community Vulnerability Index, which adds two sets of health variables to the widely used CDC Social Vulnerability Index, or SVI. 
What our graph shows is that while county risk did vary by this measure for waves one and two in 2020, in wave three, as COVID-19 tore through the US, including the so-called heartland, rates converged. And since then, peaks elevated rates are most elevated in the high vulnerability counties, but with much less variation since May 2022, as shown by the subsequent data now available at the county website, at the CDC website. So these data should be a wake-up call about using static social measures for a dynamic disease as compared to, say, less temporary vulnerable outcomes, such as cancer incidents or cigarette smoking. To start to address this problem, this insert serves some graphs we first produced in February 2021, the first to analyze real-time household poll survey data in relation to COVID-19 mortality for the 15 largest metropolitan statistical areas. The story is stark. Compounding misery, areas with highest COVID-19 mortality rates cumulative since October 2020 were also plagued by higher levels of food and housing insecurity. This commingled real-time misery effectively remains invisible on most U.S. health agency websites. Nor can the full story of disparate population burdens of COVID in the U.S. be told using solely sociodemographic or economic data. Partisan politics matter, too. Back in fall 2021, we analyzed U.S. weekly COVID death rates per 100,000 person years in relation to not only quintiles of the county level SVI, but also these SVI metrics combined with the political lean data for the 2020 political presidential election. And as you can see at the county level, the latter afforded much greater precision in identifying high versus low risk counties. In our most recent work, we've shown that since April 2021, when vaccines became available for all U.S. adults, increased exposure to conservatism as measured by the political ideology scores of the voting records of U.S. congressional representatives and senators, and also the presence of state-level Republican trifectas, meaning in control of being governor in both legislative chambers, was linked to both increased COVID-19 mortality rates and ICU occupancy at the congressional district level, taking into account vaccination rates and sociodemographic and economic context of the district's populations. One metric I've mentioned now a few times is the index of concentration of the extremes to racialized economic segregation. What led me to develop this metric was about, about six years ago, back in 2014, I found myself wondering if we in public health could do more to discern the public health ramifications of growing extreme and racialized concentrations of income and wealth. To bring into view those who benefit from a status quo in which working families are below the poverty line while the proverbial middle is being hollowed out. At issue is making inequitable social relationships visible, as opposed to focusing solely on who is harmed by injustice. One key example includes residential economic segregation, which in the U.S. is heavily racialized. The value of using measures of segregation is because they capture and portray inequity as a social relationship, because segregation, by definition, involves two or more social groups who are co-defined in relation to each other. One cannot focus on, say, solely impoverished persons. Instead, in any such measure, affluent persons are part of the picture as well. This is in sharp practice to measuring, say, solely the percent of persons below poverty, which tells you nothing about those who are above the stingy U.S. poverty line. They could be just barely above it, or they could be millionaires or billionaires. However, upon delving deeper into the public health and social science literature, I confronted two problems. First, the work seemed to focus primarily on racial segregation, often controlling for socioeconomic position, or sometimes it looked at economic segregation, but typically not taking into account racialized groups. And the two phenomena were not studied together, in part because technically measures of these two types of segregation typically cannot be put into the same model, given their high, albeit not total, correlation. Secondly, I found that most studies measured segregation at the city level or above precisely because spatial social polarization within cities means that more conventional measures cannot be used for smaller areas. For example, the Gini index of income inequality is the same for a little neighborhood where everyone is impoverished or one where everyone is affluent. And the main measure used for racial discrimination, the index of dissimilarity, can only be computed at higher levels of geography because it concerns the extent to which people in smaller units of geography nested within the higher level would need to be moved around to create even distribution at the higher level. Third, although I did find some newer measures of local segregation, all continued to cleave racial and economic segregation, and they're also problematically conceptualized and operationalized as only relative measures. 
Rummaging around, however, in the social science literature, I came across an intriguing measure developed in 2001 by Douglas Massey, who is one of the leading US scholars on racial segregation. He tellingly called his measure the Index of Concentration at the Extremes, or ICE, and designed it to be a measure of spatial social polarization, one that could be computed at multiple scales and levels of geography. Ranging from negative one to one and calculated by the provocative and deceptively simple formula shown in this slide, the ICE uniquely captures in a single metric the extent to which an area's population is or is not concentrated at one or the other end of a spectrum of privilege and deprivation. It can be used for any kind of unjust relationship. It can be computed for income. It can be computed by sexuality group, by gender identity, whatever you want. When I first came across the ICE, it had been used in several social science studies and a handful of public health analyses, but was calculated solely in relation to economic data, with results showing that it was associated with various social and health outcomes, independent of individual or household level data. Our novel contribution was to extend use of the ICE and by creating and testing an ICE not only for racialized groups, but also an ICE for racialized economic segregation, the first of its kind. Here you can see how the Boston, greater Boston area easily demonstrates why in the US the spatial realities of population distribution mean that while within city analyses are important, they're often not sufficient given the regional economics of the joint phenomena of suburbs, white fight, flight, and so-called bedroom communities inhabited by people who live near but not in the cities in which they work, thus shrinking the city's tax base. In the case of the greater Boston area, one can readily see the extreme concentrations of white persons and high income persons outside of the city boundaries versus the extreme concentration of black persons and low income persons evident in Boston. The sort of map provides a big clue say that racialized or economic comparisons constrained solely to Boston will miss a large chunk of fellow residents in the state living in nearby areas with far more resources. And it also makes one pause to think about the selection of effects about which white persons do or do not live in the city itself and which populations of color live in versus outside the city boundaries. Here's the 2014 study in which we first used the novel metric of the ICE for racialized economic segregation. For the study based within the greater Boston area, we, used ge we geocoded the records of participants in two prior Boston-based studies that I led. The United for Health study, which was of working class white, black, and Latinx workers employed in diverse job settings, for example, light bulb manufacturing, school bus drivers, grocery clerks, et cetera. And then also the My Body, My Story study, which recruited a, a random sample of black and white non-Hispanic adult members who were US born from four community Boston health centers. We then linked these records to each individual's cumulative black carbon exposure at their residential address for the year prior to their health interview and also to their census tract ICE measures. And as you can see in models controlling for relevant covariates, all three of the ICE measures were inversely associated with exposure, that is more privilege, less exposure to air pollution. And the same could not be said for either the participant's household income or their educational level. Additionally, the most extreme effect was observed for the ICE for racialized economic segregation. We observed similar patterns in our study in New York City in relation to infant mortality, premature mortality defined as death before age 65, and diabetes mortality. And though this be but one city, it's worth recalling that its population size of just over 8 million means that it has a larger population than half the countries in the European Union. Thus, for all three outcomes, the greatest relative risk consistently occurred for point estimates for the ICE for racialized economic segregation, with relative risks on the order of two to four, comparing the bottom to top quintile. These point estimates also typically exceeded those observed with the conventional poverty measure, comparing greater than or equal to 30% versus less than 10% poverty. But of course, census tracts don't exist in isolation. They are part of cities, towns, counties, et cetera. Here we show multi-level results from Massachusetts for our analysis of child mortality, that is death before age five. The rows show the different ice measures and also at the bottom, the poverty level. The first column shows results for only census tract analyses. The second column is for only city level analyses. And the third and fourth columns are for the joint census tract and city level. All models included random effects at the county and city town levels, plus adjusted for relevant covariates. And you can see first, regardless of level, the ICE for racialized economic segregation detected the largest health inequities. Second, for all 
measures, steeper gradients occurred in the single level models at the census tract level, the first column, compared to the city level, which is the second column. Third, in the multi-level models, the third and fourth columns, the effects remained far stronger for the census tract and were attenuated at the city level. We also found similar patterns for fatal and non-fatal assaults, police killings, infant mortality, premature mortality, cause-specific mortality for diabetes, cardiovascular disease, cancer overall, and specific cancer sites, as well as deaths due to smoking, and also not all non-smoking related deaths, plus also cancer incidents. Of note, the finding of greater sensitivity to inequities of the census tract compared to city town level is not surprising. It's what we would expect, given the reduction in variation caused by aggregating to higher geographic levels. Similarly, our finding that racialized economic segregation packs a stronger punch than solely racial segregation should also not be surprising. But again, I note that ours is the first such combined measure. The twofold implication is that first, Prior research relying solely on city level measures of segregation has likely underestimated the impact of spatial social polarization on health. And secondly, census tract ICE measures may be useful to track how growing spatial social polarization, which is a global phenomenon expressing rising extreme concentrations of privilege and deprivation, are becoming embodied as health injustice. Two final examples make clear the continued embodied truths of past injustice. First, for Jim Crow, whose contemporary health impacts remain barely investigated in U.S. research, our first study showed the quick impact of the legal abolition of Jim Crow in reducing infant mortality rates, leading to convergence of rates among the U.S. Black population living in the Jim Crow versus non-Jim Crow states. No such convergence occurred among the white population. What the study also documented was that nearly two-thirds of all Black infants born in the U.S. in 1960 were born in Jim Crow states, and they are now in their 60s. What might this early life exposure mean for their health and the health of their children? What might it mean for those whose childhood took place when Jim Crow was legal and now are age 70 and older? Notably, in subsequent work, we found evidence of stark Jim Crow effects of birthplace for breast cancer risk, including breast cancer estrogen receptor status. Second, for historical redlining, which refers to discriminatory policies imposed by the U.S. federal government in the 1930s via the Homeowners Loan Corporation, or HOLC, and which institutionalized racialized economic segregation nationwide, consider these preliminary descriptive work results for Boston for the first of our three studies on historical redlining and cancer. Thus, among Boston's 151 current census tracts included in the areas that had Hulk designations, 10 or under slightly 7% were in the best categories, green plus blue. Slightly over half were in yellow, which Hulk called definitely declining category. And the remaining 41% were in the red category that Hulk designated as quote unquote hazardous, hence redlining as the term. Those in the green and blue category scored high now for the ICE for racialized economic segregation, meaning higher extreme concentrations of white, Hispanic, high-income families. Those in the yellow and red scored lower, that is that they had greater concentrations of black Americans in lower income households. Census tract poverty rates likewise were lowest in the green plus blue, but twice as high in the yellow and red categories. And among women diagnosed with breast cancer, the proportion with regional or distant stage of diagnosis was lowest in the green plus blue tracks, but fully 10 points higher among those in the yellow and red. Hence, whole categories are still discriminating, as it were, among both levels of contemporary neighborhood conditions and a specified outcome. And these findings here crude were upheld by our much more sophisticated multi-level multivariable Poisson regression analyses, which nested individuals within census tracts an estimated association between cancer stage of diagnosis for not only breast, but also lung, colorectal, and cervical cancer with both whole grade and census tract characteristics, taking into account age, gender, racialized group. And we also assembled evidence of, regarding the mediation of historical redlining effects by contemporary census tract characteristics. The larger point is that it is not enough to document present day, quote unquote, deprivation. To guide policy and action for health equity, it's vital to identify the structural drivers past and present, and this means metrics that show structural injustice and relationships between privilege and harm. And so to reiterate, when it comes to health justice, the point of the two-edged sword of data is to produce actionable data for accountability. On the slide, I show two key recommendations I gave at my talk at the first public meeting of the US Federal COVID Health Equity Task Force back in February, 2021. First, the data need to be able to reveal racialized economic health inequities in real time. And second, 
the COVID data and also by inference, any other data should always be jointly presented by racialized economic group, age and gender. These recommendations built on a broader two-part proposal I first published in early 2021, and which I've since presented to both National Academy of Sciences and the NIH Office on Research and Women's Health. As shown on the slide, part one states that all U.S. health data sets and research projects supported by government funds must explicitly explain and justify their conceptualization of racialized groups and the metric used to categorize them. Part two is that any individual level health data by membership and racialized groups must also be analyzed in relation to data about racialized societal inequities, typically and almost always stemming from continued impact and ideologies of white supremacy. And finally, in relation to issues of agency and accountability, the third stipulation states that data governance requires inclusion of both health equity researchers and other members of the communities whose data are at stake, affording the expertise of lived experience. Together, these principles can help us keep our eye on the proverbial prize, which is equity and the people's health. I should be clear, for critical science to advance health justice, it's important imperative to reckon with the material fact that we always live in place in context. No matter how much we may roam around in cyberspace or stake a flag in the metaverse for good or ill, we and all other living beings on this planet live in real places, in context, and any science we produce must reckon with these embodied truths. Or as I put it, to put it another way, as I wrote when reflecting at being on the People's Climate March back in 2014, and as part of deepening my critique of decontextual science and methodological individualism, quote, indeed, the real ecological fallacy is to think that epidemiologists or others could ever understand the people's health, except in societal, ecological, and hence historical context. History and embodiment go hand in hand. By this, I mean, first, that our history lives within us from the moment we are conceived, taking on also the history of our parents and ancestors. And second, history is not a given. People have repeatedly changed history when confronting injustice. The corollary is that health inequities must necessarily be historically contingent, as I will now demonstrate. One final slide, then, of data. Back in the mid 2000s, some researchers started claiming that in the context of on average overall health improving, which isn't happening anymore, by the way, growing health inequities were not a big deal, but instead just the inevitable result of health getting better for everyone, albeit more quickly for better off people. Trickle down health, in other words. I suspected this claim was based on rather short term data reflecting the post 1980 ascendance of neoliberal policies. So I went about to, by testing this claim by examining trends in US premature mortality that is death before age 65, using US national mortality data for the period 19. 59 to 2006, which sounds easier said than done because routinely available data going back to 1968, but that's another story. And indeed, what we found as shown by the figure in the slide is discussed extensively in our 2008 plus med article was that contrary to the claim of the quote unquote trickle down hypothesis, in fact, racialized and income inequities of premortal mortality shrank between 1965 and 1980, when mortality rates were also declining for everyone, and only thereafter did they stagnate and then widen. Likely contributing to these trends was the U.S. Civil Rights Act of 1964, the 1965 U.S. Voting Rights Act, other progressive legislation involving the war on poverty, along with the creation of Medicare, Medicaid, the Environmental Protection Agency, and the Occupational Safety and Health Administration. And these progressive changes were then subjected to challenge during the long period of backlash starting under Carter in the late 1970s and taken to new levels during the Reagan administration and continued thereafter. Hence, moving forward, the work at hand will require both critical conceptual and technical skills situated in historical context. Always remember that with regard to monitoring that, of course, it is not novel to document health inequities. Rather, as the previous slide, not to mention the ones about people a century and a half ago, have illustrated, the point is tracking if they are getting better, worse, or stagnating and analyzing why. And with regard to action, always remember that this cannot be construed as being solely, quote unquote, public health interventions, solely under the rubric of health agencies, but necessarily must involve broader collaborations and coalitions for equity in all policies with the aim to maximize the health equity impact, as informed by public health understanding of the relevant exposures and ideologic periods. Remember, too, that no one piece of work ever does it all. So approach working with any data in context and always ask, who can and should do what with whom to advance health justice informed by the new knowledge generated.
And so moving forward also requires funds to cover the labor and technology to overcome decades of crippling underinvestment in public health infrastructure. And here I would flag the issue is not simply lack of funds, but societal vision, values, and priorities. After all, as I pointed out to my recently published letter in The Lancet, the estimated need for 7.84 billion for data modernization over five years is on par with 1% of the US federal military budget for fiscal year 2021. Given that over 1.1 million dead from COVID in this country is 10 times all US military casualties since World War II, surely protecting the public means protecting the public's health and is worth this 1% of the military budget. So in closing, we live and die embodied. So too does all life on earth. We are sensuous, conscious, connected, and creative, both for good and for bad. It is long past time for our sciences to integrate levels and timescales of embodiment from structural policies and structural injustice to submolecular levels across historical generations with an eye towards revealing what it means to embody dignity, equity, and joy. Another world is possible in which health justice exists on this one planet that we share. Let us do this work informed by history and a vision premise in social justice, along with deep recognition of our interconnection with and dependence on our wondrous and threatened planet. Thank you. You. Okay. Nancy, that was awesome. That was awesome. I, I do need to say you still talk so incredibly quickly <laughs> that there, there was this, this moment in terms of just trying to hold on to kind of every everything that, that you're <laughs> saying, right? Um, and, and I will say also your dry sense of humor, like, it's just like, it, it's good. All right. So, so it's <laughs> one of those things and it just kind of like, it, it's right there. Um, look, folks, we're, we're, we're short on time um, is kind of is where we are. So I'm going to take um, the prerogative here um, to uh, basically ask just a, an initial question and maybe we'll have time for one more. Um, you know, one of the things that, that's really striking in terms of kind of listening to kind of what you lay out is, is the fact that in this moment, different folks are kind of focusing on different things as key data points as being necessary for public health, right? And so the, the question that I have for you, if you're talking to health departments, when you're thinking about kind of the way, where the world is now, not where the world was five years ago, but for all the data that you presented, you know, what do you suggest are key priority areas of focus? Making sure that there are multi-level data so that it's not just about data about individuals, but brings in the community context in which they live and covers everybody. So it's not just focused on quote unquote deprived areas, but brings out the relationship between the concentration of affluence and the concentration of deprivation. So these are really key. So to contextualize the data, because otherwise there is such a emphasis because of the individualism rampant in this society, I'm making it an individual characteristic and it can't be, and it has to be put individual health within community context and the full, full community context, because you can't just talk about somehow there are people living in poorly resourced neighborhoods without talking about, well, where did all the resources go? So you need to have those kinds of metrics and that, that can be done. The second thing that's also really important is to see what can be done to get for things. I mean, certain things are more slowly moving. Cancer rates don't change that fast, but things like an infectious disease and does change quickly. So figuring out what needs to be available and then understanding that, I mean, I'm getting involved here some with what's going on, like with the sewage monitoring, which raises lots of interesting questions, because on the one hand, you want infectious disease data. On the other hand, you don't want communities that much more over surveilled for use of, for example, illicit substances. So there's a lot of, there's a lot of stuff to figure out about like what is in the sewage. Um, but public health sort of, <laughs> the public health era started with the sewage, and it's needs to go back there in many important ways, um, thinking back to the early periods of sanitary reform, where that was done to try to say that the, the framework of Chadwick at all was that actually, you know, it's people's bad habits that lead to filth, and filth causes disease, not poverty. People's bad habits also cause their poverty. So the relationship between filth, poverty, and disease have been contested back then, and they still are now. So figuring out what data need to be in real time, and do they need to be obtained from actual individuals, which is hard, versus community monitoring, whether air pollution, which can be monitored in real time, 
sewage can be monitored in real time without having to have to contact with individual people is really important. It's awesome. Um, we have one minute left. And so I, I just want to just ask, you know, what, what are some key ways that this audience can plug into these sorts of conversations in meaningful ways? I have a lot of substantive questions, but I think I, I want to just give you that one because I think it opens things up. I mean, one is through, um, as I said, right now, it's a high priority topic to have input into the, the uh, OMB uh, sessions that are happening now in real time to change what's going to happen with the U.S. racialized racialized data and the U.S. Census. The largest things that are going to are being considered right now because this is going to matter not only for what the new data are, but also for actively working with health departments about bridging data so that you can have temporal trends over time. Because again, the point is not that one is discovering that health inequities exist. That's not the discovery. That you can discover some more factors that are contributing to that, but you're also wanting to monitor it over time as a core public health function. Are things getting better or are they getting worse? You know, and so, Knowing how that's going to work with what the changes are to the racialized data is going to be really important. Presumably what will happen is that the, instead of having two separate questions, one on quote unquote race versus one on quote unquote ethnicity, which was defined back in 70 as only quote unquote Hispanic versus not. Again, there's tons written on the history and the politics of how this happened. It would be one question that would allow people to check all the options, as many as they want, have that be one question, but also expand what those options are, including also for the first time a Middle Eastern North African category, which again is another question given histories of imperialism, colonialism, whatnot, what makes Middle East North African as an area is like a whole other set of conversations as well. But it's to expand the categories and expand the kind of prompts and um, fill-ins that can be done to get more detailed data so that you don't lump all quote unquote Asian and Pacific Islanders together, but you have much more detailed data. You can clearly bring out not only the different American Indian indigenous groups, but also Native Hawaiian, et cetera, et cetera. And also so that you can identify people who are indigenous that are coming from Central and South America, which right now, and Mexico, which right now you can't do because they get put in one category or the other. So there are going to be some refinements that are happening that again will affect the final categories, but also refinements in the questions asked. So be active in the census. There's at, you can find out more about that on the census website. As I said, the, the the public hearings are just happening right now. You can send in written comments. It's all happening now because obviously, given the political timeline, they want to get this done before 2024. Clearly. So that's a big biggie, because if anybody cares about racialized inequities in this country, this, when the census changes things, that changes all the denominators for any rate you'd ever want to calculate. It changes what all the forms need to be. Um, and and making sure that health agencies, there are some states that were like 20 years laggard in catching up with the old standards, I kid you not. Many got on board. And when you think about the terrible state of the ways in which reportings by states to the CDC on the COVID racialized data, particularly for cases, but even for mortality records, which is like standard stuff, it means that people really need to be vigilant with their states about how they're reporting data, because that then goes into the national data, which then affects all the comparisons. And with that, um, um, let me thank you. Um, let me thank you for your vision, for your um, strategic approach, and obviously for, the, for these comments. Um, before uh, saying goodbye to folks and basically, you know, telling people that, by the way, this the, the recording will be available for people that felt that things were moving super quickly, just just to say. Um, but Nancy, thank you, and and thank you also. And you know, we didn't even talk about International Women's Day, which is how we all well, this came to be. So next time, all right, next but, time, right? But thank you, and thank you everybody for being with us, and have a wonderful rest of the day, everyone. Take care.